onto the stage. Good morning. There's my chair. That's brilliant. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you so much, Tim and Paul. I would like to thank Kelly and everyone associated with TEDx. Uh, I'm deeply honored to be here and to meet all these brilliant scientists and academics and scholars, and I'm proud to bring balance to this brilliance. <laughs> uh, the piece that I'm going to do for you today is a uh, segment from uh, my uh, solo show, which is uh, now touring, uh, called Guilt, A Love Story. And uh, if I can get some light on the stage, please. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is a true story about an ex-nun, an ex-Nazi, how being smart is not the same as being wise. And I uh, think it's really about why hating the haters just doesn't work. But I fit it into a larger paradigm of guilt, specifically Catholic guilt, because I come from a very Catholic background, an extremely Catholic background. We used to have open casket reunions. Um, <laughs> you see, my mother is an ex-nun, and my father was a Franciscan brother. He wore the brown robes and the rope belt and walked amongst the people like the lost Jedi of Flatbush, Brooklyn. And my father, the brother, met my mother, the sister, <laughs> when she was a uh, nurse as a nun and was transferred to Brooklyn, New York, fell madly in love, carried a torch in secret for 10 years while she went off to minister to lepers in the jungles of Malawi, Africa. And the show is about uh, their love story and what it's like to be their horribly disappointing firstborn son. Uh, a rather impossible pedigree to live up to. And it, th this piece uh, takes place when I was living in Los Angeles. Uh, my network series had just gone off the air, and I was trying to make a living doing political stand-up in the L.A. comedy clubs, which should give you a rough idea of how well-intentioned but naive I was during this period. <laughs> it takes a special kind of chutzpah to try to do political material in a town where so many are proud not to know who the mayor is. I'd be like, aren't you mad about the economy? Don't you care about AIG? Bro, I don't listen to hip hop. No! And I talk about religion a lot in my act too because I grew up admiring Jesus the way any guy would admire mom's first husband. <laughs> but I must admit, and I mean no disrespect to the faithful, I have come to view Jesus in much the way I have come to view Elvis. I love the guy, but a lot of the fan clubs freak me out. So. <laughs> I was living in L.A., trying to get by. Uh, I was sitting home one day, and my girlfriend came in and told me I had a phone call. I almost didn't pick up, because I was busy working on a treatment for a game show I was pitching about L.A. men called Gay or Armenian. But <laughs> I took the phone call, and it was a call asking me if I wanted to come on the Bill Maher show the next day. Now, I, I, I love Bill Maher, and I, I think he's brilliant, and I had done his show many, many times. But this time was going to be a little bit different. This time, the producers wanted to know if I'd be willing, since no real celebrities were, to come on the air and discuss politics and religion with David Duke. <laughs> now, for those who don't remember, David Duke is a former Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan and a former high-ranking member of the American Nazi Party. And before you get offended, I am not implying that all Nazis are Klansmen, okay? And I'm not suggesting all Klansmen are Nazis. I know they're totally separate groups. They just admire each other's work, all right? And I, I, I said, hell yes, what time? Tomorrow? Yeah, I'll be there. I'll tear this guy's head off. Because who's more fun to hate than a hater? Who are we more allowed to hate than a hater? It's the greatest free reign we have to let our id go wild. I want to put haters in camps. I want to burn crosses on their lawns. I will be there. I will destroy this man. So right away, I called my father down south. He was a retired history teacher, and I would always consult with him before I did anything on TV about politics. It was a good father-son bonding ritual, since I don't exactly kill at sports. And my father said to me, he said, what the, what the, what the, what the, what the, what the, what the hell do they want to put this racist jerk on the air for? Well, Dad, get this. Uh, he's an activist now for the rights of European Americans. That's the new PC term for honky. Uh, he does mailings <laughs> to try to raise money from other racists to fight the mongrel hordes destroying a once great democracy because Whitey's tired of taking it from the man. I'm going to kill him, Dad. I'm going to rip his head off. I'm going to slaughter him. Tell everybody it's going to be amazing TV. All right, don't go giving me a whole skit. Can you promise me one thing? Sure, Dad, anything. Can you promise me 
that you're not going to get all confrontational on the air with this guy like you did that time last year with Jerry Falwell? Well, yeah, but Pop, this is totally different. This, this guy used to wear a swastika armband in public. Yeah, so don't you be a hothead. I'll tell you right now, kid, if you go on the air and allow yourself to hate this man in front of all these people, you're going to sink right down to his level. Can you, can you promise me this? Essentially, it was like the Johnny Cash song, Don't Take Your Guns to Town, Son, Leave Your Guns at Home, Bill, Don't Take Your Guns to Town. When I was very small, my dad pulled me out of bed late. Jimmy Carter signed the Camp David Peace Accord between Israel and Egypt. He couldn't believe an American had helped bring peace to one corner of the Middle East and just wanted his kid there to witness a Christian, a Muslim, and a Jew embracing in fellowship and peace and brotherhood, and now he's asking me to be nice to a Nazi. So the next day, my girlfriend Charmy and I got to the studio early for the taping, and backstage the mood was already tense. Duca told the producers he got a lot of d and would only try a wretched hive of race mixing and villainy like Hollywood if the producers agreed to fly him and his personal bodyguard first class both ways. They agreed, good for ratings, but when Duke showed up in the green room in a sharp corporate pinstripe suit, a self-assured smile stretched across his surgically altered but fetchingly shiny face. The bodyguard directly behind him was revealed to be imposing, blonde hair, blue-eyed, Russian, Aryan, five-foot-two, 23-year-old girlfriend. <laughs> Staff at the Bill Maher show were furious they had been so deceived. Because, come on, it's one thing for a guy to be a Holocaust-denying white supremacist Klansman. But on top of that, now he was also a dick. The show hadn't even begun taping, and already backstage, everyone was furious with David Duke. Everyone except me. I was going to give this man love. I was going to be muy tranquilo. I was going to keep my promise. On the set, the mood was dark with a strong chance of ugly. The studio audience, nice tourists from around the country, could sense it from the first moments of the taping. David Duke began the broadcast by lamenting the terrible plight of the European American. The people, he said, had built this great country all on their own. And he says to Bill Maher, he says, well, I'm just like you, Bill. I'm rebelling against political correctness, but a lot of people out there are not comfortable hearing the truth. But by the time he said, white people are becoming a minority in their own country, the panel and the audience could smell the blood in the water. But I didn't attack him. I, I, I respectfully disagreed. I talked about scapegoating. I talked about economic racism. I quoted Bob Dylan's only a pawn in their game. And I tried to not make any flippant jokes. So when Duke said at one point, well, I'll tell you what, the blacks have our cable channel, and the Hispanicals have their own 24-hour channel. Have you noticed there's not one channel devoted exclusively to white people of European descent? And why is that? I wanted to say, no channel for white people. Somebody's not watching his NASCAR network. <laughs> no, 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 I, no, no, I sat on it. Don't take your guns to town, son. Leave your guns at home, Bill. Now, by the halfway point of the show, Duke was trying to justify bringing racial segregation back in this century by holding up a Xerox paper chart he had brought in his pocket that said, that black men rape white women 200 times more than white men rape black women. And this is all the proof you need, he said, right here on this chart that I have in my freaking pocket to show that Caucasians are better, more civilized, and endangered. And that's the worst part about Americans are losing their true heritage of Jesus Christ. At the commercial break, the house lights came up, the stage lights went dim, the studio warm-up comic gamely jumped on stage to try and lighten the mood. I leaned over to Mr. Duke and I said, you do realize this Jesus you speak of was a peaceful, radical, nonviolent revolutionary who hung around with lepers, hookers, and crooks. He never spoke English, wasn't an American citizen, was anti-capitalism, anti-death penalty, anti-public prayer. Yes, he was, man, Matthew 6, 5, anti-public prayer, but never once anti-gay, never mentioned abortion, never mentioned premarital sex, never called the poor lazy, never justified torture, never fought for tax cuts for the wealthiest Nazarenes, and never asked a leper for a copay. And he was a long-haired, brown-skinned, that's in Revelation, brown-skinned, homeless Middle Eastern Jew.
Duke looked at me, bewildered, and my hand to God, this is true, he replied, I'm not capitalist. That's your Nazi comeback? Sprickens die Deutscher! Right, all right, all right. Now, now we had crossed over from kind of weird to David Lynch on tainted meth. I was starting to get angry. I was starting to get preachy. And I was starting to realize that I'd been taking this guy, then this show, and my own morality a little too seriously. So back on the air, friends, and now I'm dropping the whole Christ act. So when Duke said he was part of the modern reformed clan, I shot back, oh yeah, reformed clan? What does that mean? You guys use soft rope? And it wasn't funny, but it felt good. <laughs> now the room is getting really ugly, and Duke blitzkrieged on. If y'all don't believe me, you take a look outside when you leave the studio tonight, people. There are more Mexicans in California than there are in Mexico. I shot back, dude, that's because we stole California from the Mexicans. <laughs> now, please, I never, ever, ever say the word dude, okay? I, I, my mom raised me better, and I knew I was failing when I began a sentence with it. I, I think it was Gandhi who said, uh, the first man to use dude as a prefix is the man who's run out of ideas. <laughs> I think it was Gandhi. It might have been Bono. I don't know who said that, but Duke was outraged. We did not steal California, he said. Dude, 1850, President Polk marched to Zachary Taylor's troops and occupied California. They shot at us for crossing their frontera. The papers back home reported our boys were under fire so the public would get behind a war the way they always do. And we took it because Polk wanted more slave states. Don't tell me, man. This is how I earned my father's love. <laughs> Duke was outraged. Turned this man hates himself because he's white. I hate myself because I'm Catholic. <laughs> now... Now the show is a cacophony, a hateable hate fest of the hateful hater being openly despised. The panel was fighting, the audience is screaming things at the stage, the producers were nervous, and things were on the verge of being not good TV. <laughs> My youthful hubris told me something had to be done. I, 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 I had to find a way to make this ugly scene funny. So, with just a few minutes left, I knew what I wanted to say. Forgetting my parents had told all their friends and all my extended family in the South and New York to watch, I turned to America's most famous racist one last time, and I said, you know, I, 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 I want to apologize to you, sir, if I've been rude on the show. I haven't intended to be hurtful or malicious. I know anybody as far to the right as you is clearly in a lot of pain, and, well, anybody who hates gay men as much as you is obviously crying out for help, and, well, I become convinced tonight that there's nothing wrong with you, sir, that hot sex with a man couldn't fix. <laughs> I stood up slowly so the cameras could follow me and said, come on, right now, punk. You and me, lather up. I began taking off my coat. I began taking off my belt. The studio audience, they were like a coliseum full of Romans finally getting their money's worth out of these lions. I was becoming an alternative comedy god. I was smothering my inner altar boy, and it felt good, and it felt moral and righteous. And I said, come on, punk, right now. I'll cross over to the dark side for you, Obi-Wan. Ha! I'll make you bite the pillow, bitch. <laughs> the next day, <laughs> something amazing happened. For the first time since I moved to Los Angeles, I felt normal. I felt good. And everywhere I went in that loneliest of all the lonely cities, total in the show and walked up just to shake my hand. In LA, black folks and Asians, Latinos, Caucasians, old people, gay men, attractive straight women. Uh, my girlfriend called to say she was getting phone calls and emails from people who thought it was hilarious. A rainbow coalition of appreciation and understanding and support and love. And by late in the afternoon, I felt totally confident about calling my parents. <laughs> uh, Dad, you're not upset, are you? I'm not upset, just disappointed. Never a good sign when Catholic dad talks like Jewish mom. <laughs> Pop, I'm really sorry, but come on, did you hear the stuff that guy was saying? Yeah, I heard it. And I expected more out of you. I thought that stunt you pulled in the end there was in very poor taste. Your mom and I were both shocked. And you should know better, JJ. What are you thinking? There's a lot of powerful gay men in your industry, kid. You have no idea who you offended with that little stunt. Dad, the only people I offended were the gay Nazis and the gay Klansmen in my industry. Can I talk to Mom, please? Well, actually, your mom's pretty shaken up, and uh, she's not ready to talk to you today.
Now, this had never happened. My mother was in Malawi, Africa. Uh, crocodiles would snatch babies off the riverbanks while their mothers did laundry. She did surgery on lepers in the jungle. The woman doesn't flip out easily. And now she's traumatized over a sex joke? A day later, and I'm undone. All my pride, all my self-esteem, out the window, shade the edge of sketch, delete, delete, dead as disco. Oh my God, how could I do this? They left the clergy to have me, and this is how I thank them? I'm a terrible son. Call your parents, my girl. God, what's the deal with all the guilt? Pick up the phone and, like, talk it out like adults. <laughs> yeah, Protestants. <laughs> I'm not going to call my parents. That would be unmanly and weak. I write an email. That I was only being outrageous to this hateful man to make the people laugh? My mother emails back a very long, very Catholic missive. The first paragraph mentions what a difficult and painful labor I had been. <laughs> and the fact that I had been three weeks past my due date had meant either I was dead in the womb or didn't want to come out. First paragraph. <laughs> and essentially, my mom was tizzied up because I went on the TV and talked about S-E-X. And you might have sexual hang-ups if you had religious parents or if you had parents. And I blame, you know, parts of the Bible, St. Paul, not Jesus. Paul was the guy with all the hang-ups. And, and, and the Puritans, never forget, this country was founded by people so uptight they got kicked out of England. But when I was 11 years old, I learned what a vow of celibacy was. And I realized my parents weren't just uncomfortable talking about sex. They had promised God they would never do it. Of course, I was too young to know the first pope had been married. All the popes and priests for a thousand years were married. It wasn't until 1139 A.D. that Innocent II, not wanting clergy to leave wealth to their kids, made celibacy the law, not because sex was bad, not because Christ was a bachelor, but because the church was greedy way before Da Vinci Code. <laughs> All I knew was my parents swore they would never do this, and as the firstborn child, I was living, breathing proof they had broken their end of the pact. And my entire existential crisis began right then. I called my mother. Joseph, it's okay, it's okay, baby, I love you. I love you so much. But nothing you say or do could ever, ever change how much I love you. But I couldn't believe I heard you saying those words. I never imagined my adult son behaving that way. Yeah, but mom, the Nazis started it. Didn't you hear what he said about the rapes and the blacks and the, the country on there? No, 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 I'm sorry, Mom, no, but given the circumstances, I think humiliating that hateful hater was the moral thing to do. And I realize you feel that way. But based on the way we tried to raise you, I failed to see how saying, I will make you bite the pillow, bitch, <laughs> is the moral option. Now, I really hate it when stories employ this trite little plot device I call the it was then I realized moment, but here's mine. It was then I realized I had changed, I had grown. I knew that we'd all move beyond this, but I also knew because of this hateful hater, I had finally given my family the kind of gift I never One brings family has to have a few anecdotes that do not get mentioned at the weddings, at the funerals, at the reunions, the bar mitzvahs. No one in my family would ever say, hey, could you pass the cranberry sauce over here, please? Oh, and remember the time your firstborn tried to sodomize the Nazi? <laughs> not long after these events, David Duke was indicted on charges of felony tax fraud and felony mail fraud. It turns out he'd been in bed and him and used it to finance his gambling addiction. <laughs> gambling with someone else's money. He really was a capitalist. He was sentenced to 11 months in a federal pen, and for the second time in my life, I found myself ethically conflicted by David Duke. On the one hand, I'm glad he got locked up. On the other hand, of course I can feel pity for any man so lost and mired in that kind of hate. On the other hand, I think anybody who wants to bilk ignorant racists out of their hard-earned cash should be set free and allowed to continue their fine patriotic work. But even still to this day, as I travel and crisscross this glorious mosaic, this grand experiment, this ever-evolving work in progress that is a murka. <laughs> and now and then in a crowded airport, I'll catch myself murmuring out loud a soft little prayer. I just hope the warden gave Dave a real nice pillow. <laughs>